Seven pillars. Let's talk about pillars today. Pillars, and um, I'm going to choose to do it, I think, in the Hebrew tongue, amud. Amud means to make a stand, or that's the prime of it, to make a mod, to make a stand. I mean, you've got to stand for something. And of course, pillar being to stand, upholding that that is above, all right? And inasmuch as we have just covered the third chapter of Revelation in our weekly studies, then we're going to talk about the fact that God said through the Son that in the eternity, especially the millennium, that those churches, especially the church that has the truth, the one that overcomes, the church of Smyrna, and particularly Philadelphia, that know who those are that claim to be of our brother Judah, but in fact do lie and are of the synagogue of Satan, I will make you pillars in my temple. So you kind of better know what you're doing there, or you're not going to make it there in the first place. So, amut, to stand, and the prime being to stand for something, and it had better be God's word. Okay, so open your Bibles, if you would, and as much as I mentioned the third chapter of the great book of Revelation, open your Bible there as we search the, the word for, his, for our understanding. Now, most of you are familiar with the words to the Church of Philadelphia, the, having the key of David, meaning understanding the seed line, understanding the genealogy of David, whereby you're not deceived concerning um, who the true Messiah is, that you couldn't be deceived as far as the faults is concerned, the fact that you can open doors and no one can shut them. Why? You have the truth. You have so many people telling fairy stories concerning religion that they try to close doors you might open or uh, and you may have to close a few doors that they do open of untruthfulness. So, meaning you can't be deceived if you understand and have the faith to know God's word is accurate, that it's true. It's rather a high calling to be a pillar in the very temple of God. Are we worthy? Probably not. But in Christ, who on repentance forgives us all our sins, hey, maybe we can... Maybe so. But the important thing is that you be man, woman, or child enough that you can make a stand regardless of what some might think. That you're going to make a difference. You may even have to be a little bit salty. Salt makes a difference. Not for the sake of being different, but for the sake of being in the right path. That is to say, the way that Christ has shown us not wavering, solid, making that stand, then you can begin to say, well, maybe, maybe I could be a part of that temple because I sure wouldn't follow anyone else. Well, maybe not knowingly you wouldn't, but we have people that you can take nuts and let them spring up most anywhere that like to deal in fantasies and anything that kind of makes the heart beat a little faster fairy tales, even in a kinship to the truth. And people will travel many distances to get to that nut when they had the word with them all the time. And that's what's important. Many of you that have traveled so far to be here, you may have said, what is he talking about? <laughs> Well, I hope I'm not a nut. I may be, but the word isn't, all right? I mean, there are people that might call this one a nut, be that as it may. But God's word is not, uh, and you have faith in that or you wouldn't be here, okay? So let's cover just a little bit here. Um, naturally, you know that Smyrna and Philadelphia were the only, I repeat, only two churches out of seven that Christ found no fault with. So you'd better be in a group that studies and teaches those truths or you're in trouble. So let's, let's just, for the sake of time, 
pick up on the blessings that fall out from being in one or the other of those churches. And you find that in verse 10 of the third chapter of Revelation, the unveiling, and it reads, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world. Not just part of it. The deception, the lie, will be over the earth like a flood. And many, many are going to jump right into it. All the world. You're not going to. Why? You're not going to be tempted because you know the truth. And you're not going to believe a lie. To try them that dwell on the earth. What's the purpose of it? God always has a purpose. Do you know why he wants to try them? To see who has done their homework. Who's been working in the word and who's lazy in it. I'm sorry, God doesn't need lazy people. Doesn't have much use for them in that condition. He just doesn't. And he makes it very clear. It's a time of trial. Why? Those that have not the wisdom that is portrayed in this word will be deceived. Many of your own relatives will be. Get set for it. But praise God, we do have the millennium. And many of them perhaps will even listen when you're delivered up. But you will not be tempted. Tempted against what? Well, let me ask you. Could you be tempted to worship Satan? Hmm? I don't think so. I don't think you think that much of him. I think it would be an abomination to you to think about getting on your knees before that person, Satan. I don't think they could, I don't think that even at the threat of death, probably that you would worship him. You would rebel. Why? You do not find him tempting. That's what temptation amounts to. It is a trial to see who finds Satan tempting and who do not. Basically, that's what it comes down to. You might say, well, isn't that stretching the point a little bit? No. That's why the key of David is mentioned in this church. And that's why knowing those that claim to be of our brother Judah and do lie and are of the synagogue of Satan is brought out because they're going to worship Satan in his church. That's what a synagogue is, is a church. I don't know, do you find it tempting? It's going to be very glamorous. It's, it, hey, I, let me just tell you, coming out the gate, it's going to be where the majority, unfortunately, at that time on earth might be persuaded to go. Why? Because he's going to be singing the old song, I've come to carry you home. All you that are weak and heavy laden, come with me. You got any bills? Want me to take care of them for you? Well, come this way. All one and all, just as you are, come on. So, here we find that could be rather tempting to some, could it not? If they'd been taught falsely, wrongly, whether in innocence, and I doubt very, that very few are taught purposely wrong, but simply misled. Now, verse 11, Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. You better have a little starch in your back. You better be willing to make a stand for what you believe. Or somebody's going to yank your little old reward right off your head. All right? Is that possible? I don't think so. But watch out. Verse 12, this is why we came here. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go out, he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Do you know what that name is? Have you ever studied the, the millennium chapters in the book of Ezekiel? 
Do you know what the final words of the book of Ezekiel are? When he arrives, he will be called, and his name, the, your name, what? Yahweh Shema, which is to say what? God dwells there. That's it. Forever and ever, no more will you go out. And you can read it for yourself. The last closing words, the new name, is written in the great book of Ezekiel. So, pillar... What does it mean being a pillar in his temple? Well, a pillar even to good old Webster's holds up that that is above. It's a foundation for that that's above. Do you hold up or uphold that that is above? I hope you do. It's your father. It's his word. And the very fact that you would be a support, that is to say to actually of God's own house, and that really gets touching when you go on to the eternal temple and you find out what the temple is in that new city, that it is Christ and the Father, that you have a part within that. That's an awesome, awesome thought, but you earn it today by understanding the simplicity. And don't let some nut cloud the simplicity for you, or you just could get deceived. You could be drawn off track. Stick with God's word. He knows exactly what's going to fall, how it's coming down, and what your part in it is. Well, those are certainly magnificent words. God chose many before the foundations of this earth to plant that little seed that they would see and understand the truth. But probably the better part or the better place to understand this is following the great words of wisdom in the great book of Proverbs. Let's turn there. Proverbs um, chapter 9, 8 being, wisdom speaketh. Well, what does she speak about? Well, verse chapter 9 will kind of let us know what wisdom speaks of and what wisdom possesses. Uh, and hopefully you will possess wisdom. Because never forget, when you possess wisdom, she possesses you. And she's beautiful. Knowing, number one, that all wisdom comes from your father. Or you can be streetwise, you know, and you can really handle yourself well, even in the bad parts of town. But that's not true wisdom that's eternal. Do you know why? Because in the eternity, we're not going to have a bad part of town. That goes with the bad. So true wisdom must be eternal. And true wisdom will teach you, number one, to stay out of the bad time, part of town. All right, enough said on that. Chapter 9, verse 1, and it reads, Wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. Whoa, seven pillars. A moot to make a stand. A mad. Do you know that a mad besides to take a stand also means ordain? There's predestination within that word. Wisdom hews out seven pillars. How in the book of Romans now God said, I've set aside 7,000 that are not going to bow and need a bail. Right. Well, isn't that wonder by chance? Well, there's no by chance about it. That's a fact. What does hew mean? Have you ever seen anybody whittle? That's kind of hewing. Sometimes God has to whittle on you a little bit. Okay? You get on an ego trip or something like that, or if I should, God has a way of just cutting you right back down to size. Wisdom, well, I thought I would be perfect if I had wisdom. No, wisdom hewed seven pillars. That means they had to be shaped and formed in life, go through tribulation, hardship, 
but never their faith wavering. So wisdom has those seven pillars. And again, pillars meaning to make a stand and from the prime amad, meaning even to be ordained for that purpose. Eh, fits, solid, not afraid to teach that. Wisdom, naturally, is a place where you find success, happiness, peace of mind. Well, where do I look for it? In the word of your father, the greatest counselor. No man, this man or any other man, can help you the way God's word will. When it, um, when it loosens to you the seals of truth, uh, success, prosperity, God gives you what you can handle. No more, no less. And the wiser you get, the more you can handle, whether it be of truth or even of, of worldly goods. When you learn how to use worldly goods, God lets you, you just piles them up on you. But, you know, he knows that if he gives you too much, that somebody's, if you're not really wise, somebody's going to skin you out of it anyway. Whew, bye-bye birdie, it's gone. So that's just the balance of wisdom is that a person is able to hang on to whatever in their lifespan they're wise enough to hang on to or to cause it to grow. I think probably if I would want you to remember any one word other than the seven pillars is the hewn part. For there's work within that. And many times when you're tested and you know God is shaping you, you don't like it so much, perhaps. I mean, it hurts sometimes. Probably the best thing for you to do is say, Thank you, Father, I've got the message. Help me shape up for you. Not that I can be somebody, not that I can be a pillar, but that I can help your children that are not pillars. You see, then you're beginning to shape up, and then you're beginning to knock on the heartstrings of your father from whom blessings flow. We are sent for that purpose, the sick. That is to say, spiritually sick, as well as the other. And the way we make our father happy, you see, he's got kids out there that are hurting. They're hurting a bunch. And he weeps for those children. Now, which is he going to be the prouder you of if you say, Oh, Father, here I am, the greatest pillar of the temple. <laughs> well, look at your child. Or, if you go over and help one of those children he's worried about and say, Get up from there and stop acting like that. You know, get your act together. And help that child change his life. Being an old Marine, I know one way, all right, or two, you know. And if the first doesn't work, I guarantee you the second always will. You know, that's, you can mark success that way. But which do you think he's going to think the more of? The great polished pillar? Or the one that makes him say, I love that child and that one has helped him. Praise God. So you see, we have to remember our purpose. If you lose sight of that purpose, I'm sorry you're not wise. Sorry. You don't fit. Not wise at all. So the many-membered body does many things in helping God's children. And Jesus simplified that when he said... Oh, he goes out there and he gets around those drunks and uh, wine bibbers and the sinners and hear us holier than thou goody goody two shoes folks he won't have nothing to do with. And Jesus said, Those are the people I'm sent to. They need me. You don't. You're past help. <laughs> okay. 
So remember that. When we read, why do I feel it's necessary that we bring this part in when I say, we're pillars in the temple of God and wisdom hews them out so they got to be wise. They got to be something special. Well, for a special reason, to help the children. What is a temple for? It's a church. It's to help people, not to stand up and glisten. No, no not at all. God won't bless you for that, all right? So I would insist that you remember the word hew, because God's going to hew on you. That means whittle. Verse 2, she hath killed her beast, she hath mingled her wine, she hath also furnished her table. She's preparing a great feast, all right? She's made everything ready, wisdom has. Now that's a comfort when you stop and think that once you accept it, you're invited, and kind of a lot of it is done for you by who? By wisdom. Three, she hath sent forth her maidens, she crieth upon the highest places of the city. This is the word maiden here in the Hebrew is young persons, male or female, and it means that, but we being as the bride of Christ, naturally this is situated here. It's where it would stipulate seven women go into one man, that one man being Christ, of course. And uh, so playing from that, uh, we see here that um, did she, I, I can't help taking advantage of this, did she within herself pick a person that that person could say, we be kind of... Uh, Elect and we're kind of uh, secluded from others, yes. No, I cried from the highest mountain, you all come. The meal is prepared. I thank God for the platform that he has given us where we go into millions and millions of homes, but the siftings are, though they are great, if you go into... Uh, over a hundred million homes, you are to get a couple of hundred thousand. You know, that's pit. That's a pittance. It is. That's a pittance of sifting. But thank God he has given us a big sifter. Otherwise, how would we reach them with truth and the word? He's certainly given us a large level, but how many here? Not many. But enough enough, but we will continue to cry. From the highest mountain, you're welcome. For you see, if you forgot that, you would forget your overall purpose. And God's blessings would be snipped. And there would be some serious hewing begin with that pillar that was right there. You know, there's one thing about a stick of wood. It can be there, and if you whittle on it too much, what happens? It's just a pile of shavings. It won't hold nothing up. Excuse the colloquialism, but my mind goes back to the times I've seen huge heaps of shavings from, from uh, whittling. And maybe a little toy was all that was left over. Okay, be that as it may. Verse 4. Uh, Whoso is simple... Let him turn in hither. Uh, simple meaning seducible. If you want to really get down to the prime that will help you with it, make it seducible. Whosoever is seducible, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him. In other words, if, you, if your mind isn't settled and you're a little bit unstable, and... Um, uh, you're unsuspecting of what's in the world. Turn in here. Who? To wisdom. To your father. And get some maturity about you as you gain gray hair. Verse 5. Come eat of my bread. Wisdom speaking now. And drink of the wine which I have mingled. I've put it together for you. I've brought it all together for you. Six. Forsake the foolish, that's the heartless, and live, that means live what? Live forever, and go in the way of understanding. Now listen to me. You've all heard me say, probably on television, and it really, 
some people just blanch when they hear me say, plant a seed, and if it doesn't go, don't worry about it. You don't need them. If they're too foolish to understand the truth and God will not sprout the seed in their mind, you better leave them alone because they're nothing but trouble for you. But you just said he said to help the children, the ones that will listen, not the foolish, or you become a what? If all you do is spend your time trying to help a fool, what does that make you? A fool, of course. So anytime you think, well, I, I, I am really good, you know, I do know God's word. I think I could convince anyone, boy, are you a fool. You are set up, you're setting yourself up for a big fall. Only God can cause a seed to germinate. Now, I'm not talking about salvation here. I'm talking about wisdom and teaching on a third level. Only those that that seed germinates will God draw to him. And you're not stronger than God. So just remember that little verse in case you start um, spending too much time treading water with an individual that maybe you personally really like. If the seed won't grow, God don't want them yet on that level, all right? First level, second level, salvation, fine. And we got the millennium, we got the appearance of the false messiah, a lot of things coming on. See what they do. Verse 7, He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame. And he that rebuketh the wicked man getteth himself a blot. Meaning what? Um, wisdom is sufficient to teach you uh, when and to whom reproof is given. Do you understand that? Do you want me to say it again? Wisdom is sufficient to teach you who, repu who reproof or rebuff is necessary to give to. Wisdom will do that. Wisdom will tell you not to waste your time pretty soon. Do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, why should you go out and spill your guts to somebody that's going to turn around and give you a black eye in your own community? You know what that guy believes? It's trouble, friend. That's what that verse means. And you're going to get shame if you try to reprove or convert one of them past planting the seed and giving God the privilege of choosing or not choosing. Verse 8, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. He'll love you all the more. Well, how can I tell? Wisdom will tell you. The seed will sprout. And do you know what? Anybody's wise enough to look when you plant a seed. <gasps> look, three or four, five days to ten, whatever the germination period is. <gasps> I've got a plant. It's growing. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out, whether a seed is growing or not. Usually it comes in the form of a question to you. Otherwise, mom is the word. But I've got to save the world. No, Christ will do that. All right, Christ is real able. You just do your little part and we'll all keep plowing along. Verse 9. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. He's going to learn more. You're not wasting your time there. You're not playing the fool. It's being appreciated and it's being practiced and it's being put to work. Verse 10, the fear or the reverence of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you ever want to know what the beginning of wisdom is, it is reverence to your father. That's the basics. And the knowledge of the Holy, that's the Holy Spirit, yes, is understanding. Can you understand when you don't understand when you think, well, that word is confusing, spend a little more time on it, and hey, it doesn't hurt to pray, you know. Your so-called scholars pray a lot, okay? 
And if they're in good standing with God, he will answer a lot. That's why they can call themselves true scholars, because they have special help from our Father. Verse 11, For by me thy days shall be multiplied. They'll become great. Wisdom will do that for you. And the years of thy life shall be increased. And this really in the Hebrew means increased in importance. Now, you know, it's funny what the human mind will do when you say increased in importance. Importance to who? Well, God, of course. That's what we're talking about, all right? Not people necessarily but to your Father. But let me tell you something, in as much as all blessings flow from Him, that's that's good, that's real good. Verse 12, if thou be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself. But if thou scornest, especially if you scorn wisdom, stay with me, thou alone shalt bear it. In other words, if, um, if you are wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself. It's for your own benefit to be wise. And if you're not, and if you scorn as wisdom, do you know who you hurt? Yourself. That's all, basically. Oh, hey, you maybe could have touched a lot of those children for him had you wanted to, if you'd been wise, if you hadn't have scorned wisdom. And sometimes the thing of God and all their wisdom and glory may seem a little foolish to man at times on level one. But climb on up to level three and take another gander and, and look at what the purpose overall is and get your little old self out of it as much as you can. Not totally. Self is important. But the brethren that are lost is what it's all about. All right? The brethren that need to be sealed, the truth in their mind, that's what it's all about. And if you want God's blessings, you'll go for that, rather than seeking out sensationalism for myself. I just want to, I want to just ding my gourd. Just get all kinds of little wisdoms poked in here and write a few things into God's Word. God doesn't, wisdom isn't that way. Wisdom... True wisdom is to take that that is very complicated and simplify it whereby anybody can understand. If they're meant to, that's wisdom. And that brings God's blessings. And that's what you're here for. Verse 13, a foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. Now this is just the opposite of verse 1. All right. God is always real good, isn't he? You know, it's like say, then look, on the other hand, look at this girl. We looked at wisdom, she's beautiful. Let's take a look here now at this girl. And hey, men, don't think he's letting you off the hook. It's just that naturally, who do you think God would, what gender did you think God would call wisdom? Hmm? I expected a little bit of amens from the females in this congregation. <laughs> All right, verse 14. For she, I just wanted to see if you were awake, that's all. <laughs> okay, 14. For she sitteth, now this is the old clamorer, okay. You know what a clamorer is, I surely don't have to explain that to you. You've all known at least one in your lifetime. And some of you men might have even been married to one. I don't know, a clamorer. For she sitteth at the door of her house on a seat in the high places of the city. She's going to get up there where she can be seen. All right, 15. To call passengers who go right on their ways. This is to say people that mind their own business. Now, beloved, perhaps, perhaps I would be, it would be better if I said this clamorer represents false religions. Okay? She gets right up, she gets the biggest bell. <laughs> ding, ding, gets the biggest building. Y'all, come on down down here. You know, and I mean, just really puts the dog on, all right? I mean, that's churching, you know, when you're down there with her, because she cuts the biggest wake, all right? And um, 16, whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. And as for him that wanteth understanding, 
she saith to him. She, see, I, now there's something very important here. Do you see what God's doing for you? Do you see what she is imitating? Do you see what false religion is imitating? She's using the same language as wisdom. God wants you to see that. She is using the identical language as wisdom utilizes. All right, important. 17. Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Now, I want you to think, uh, this is a saying from a very dry desert country. I mean, water is better than candy, all right? It's precious. It's a stolen water. You know, you, but um, it, it's just not good. It's a, it's a very... Uh, Temporary thing. And religion can take you down Primrose Lane. She can, religion can put on a big show. And I don't know how they excuse leaving God's word out of it, for God's word should be taught, but rarely is it. You're put on a high, whether it be spiritually and or otherwise, by emotionalism that, you know, as a psychologist, it's real easy to put somebody on an emotional trip. If I were to utilize psychology, I could get to a lot of people, you know? But hey, that's, a, that's basically a man, and you only utilize psychology whereby it betters God, not yourself or not a crowd. And it, um, they, I received some, I mentioned on television that I was going to give a certain party an honorary doctorate in psychoceramics, you know. And I received about 12 diplomas in the mail to yesterday, made up, ready to sign and send. Only they bettered it. I can't even tell you what theirs totally consisted of. Naturally, psychoceramics, you know, what a psycho is, and you know what ceramics. Ceramics is a pot. It's a cracked pot, okay? <laughs> An expert in being a crack pot, all right? So anyway, uh, that's her name of, that's the name of her game, friend. Be alert. Can you be tempted? Are you wise enough to miss the rat rocks and the rapids of life? They're there. Verse 18, and he knoweth not that the dead are there, and that her guests are the depths of hell. False religion. He doesn't realize that he's in, been invited right to hell. Now some of you might say, oh, now that's overdoing it. Oh, is it? Is it really? Let me just give you a little modern day plea. Believe on the Lord and you have nothing else to worry about. True statement. As long as you'll follow up the other way. Join with us. You don't have to understand God's word. Why? Because when the tribulation comes, you're going to be gone. You're going to be flowing out of here. The Messiah is coming to gather us to him. Now, First, or before any of this happens, that's what happened first. Now, I'm going to say that over, I'm going to be generous, over 50% of the churches in the United States of America and the world teach that today. Okay? In not necessarily exactly those words, but hey, they'll get around to it, give them time. Now, let me ask you a question. In relationship to this clamorous one, and this old boy's invited where the dead is, that means he was invited to hell and thought he was in church. Now, you have studied God's word and you know who the Messiah is that appears next. It's the devil. They're being invited to worship who? The devil. They're being invited to hell, though they're well-meaning, and my heart bleeds for them. 
And there's going to be some very sad people that will be praying for mountains to fall on them because, not because they're bad people, but because they're ashamed to face the true Christ. Because they really meant well. Really meant well. But, you know, mints won't get it done. A mint's not bad for after you've eaten something, but what you meant and what you do is two different things. That you bet it had better be what God's word does and says and brings you. And you'd better treasure, and I do mean treasure wisdom. Does does that mean I'm talking against those people? No. But like a voice crying from the wilderness to warn as that same voice that cried from the wilderness of long ago warned the true Messiah is coming. Well, the true Messiah is coming, but I tell you, as the Church of Philadelphia would teach, the false is also. You better have the key of David and understand his method of operation, his M.O., because he's going to deceive a lot of people. Does that mean then that I'm disliking that church? No, God knows I love them. You know, it would be so much easier for one to take, the, to take the smooth course than it would to make a stand. But, you know, it may seem that way. But after all is said and done, in your own heart and the mind you have to sleep with at night, it's a lot better to take the straight course. That is to say, God's way. Because it doesn't matter. That's the way it's going to happen As people would say, amen, you know what amen means? That's that. And that's all there is to it. That's that. That's what it means. Now, we're kind of digressing through the um, order of scriptures. We started in Revelation. We're going to end in Genesis. Esau and Jacob. Esau has married two Canaanite women and And God and his own father are very upset at him, the mother especially. And they send Jacob over to Laban's, his own people, to get a wife rather than intermingling here with these people in in Genesis 28. Esau sees this and he runs out real quick and marries uh, an Ishmaelite, uh, a couple of them there hoping to get back in good with his father. Well, it didn't work all that well. So let's pick it up, if we may, about verse 10 concerning pillars. Verse 10 reads, And Jacob went out, Genesis 28, verse 10, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. Haran, of course, means the mountain. Beersheba means the well of seven. All right, so we got seven back in here again. All right. It can even be translated, Beersheba is the oath of seven. Verse 11, And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set and it's getting dark. And he took of the stones of that place, they were rather smooth basically, and he put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. Now, let's take the word pillows for a moment. Mara Aisha. It's it's a headrest. It means a headrest. And what is a rest for your head? Number one, Jacob was the head of Israel, as far as man goes. Why? He was the father of it. And Marasha from which it comes, uh, means rather the head one, okay? Or two head, to, um, um, uh, that's not the, headship, means headship. It means dominion. So within this pillow, we have that dominion that God shall choose. In the simple form of a pillow. Maybe now you get a little different slant on Ezekiel chapter 13 where they were sowing pillows, dominion over God's hands, teaching people to fly to save their souls. And God says, I'm against your pillows, your dominion. I don't like it. 
Okay, that's Ezekiel 13, different time. But anyway, here we have, he picks this pillow and it becomes his head rest. Now, you know what the word Sabbath is. It's rest. Rest. That's what it means. And this was the rest for the head of Israel. As a matter of fact, Jacob's name will be changed to Israel after he has a little wrestling match. Okay. And he is resting his head in this head ship. Right. Now think about that for a moment. Some might say, well, you're reading a great deal into that. No, I'm not. Merja, that's exactly what it means. And basically that's the prime of the word pillow. So, so uh, there you have it. Let's see what happened there. Verse 12. And he dreamed. And behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached the heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascended and descended on it. What does that say? What is a ladder? It's, it's a way that you can get from one place to another. That you can climb higher or you can climb down, okay? But that ladder is Christ. He is the headship. And Christ is your open gate to heaven. He is your way to speak to God. He is your rest as well. So here we have the head or founder or father, earthly speaking, of Israel on the headrest, and God is showing him how to approach the father. And naturally it must be done through Messiah, being the latter. 13. And behold... The Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. This was his promise, his covenant. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all, I repeat, that's A-L-L, -L, all the families of the earth be blessed. Make sure that you do bless all families. What's that talking about? All races are to be blessed. Why? Christ would come through this one. And whomsoever will believe upon Christ. This does not have anything to do with the pillar but it has a great deal to do with salvation and the work of those that are classified pillars in God's church. 15. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. That's a promise from God, and you can claim it and count on it. You can ride on it. You can have faith in it. It's real. Even to this day, He will never leave thee, nor will He forsake thee if you exercise faith, truth, charity, loving God, allowing Him into your life, learning how to climb and descend a ladder. I speak spiritually. That is to say, to approach your Father and thank Him for His blessings. Don't just say, I'll... Thank you, thank you, Lord, for your blessings. And then go on about your life when you really need something. It better be thank him every day for the wisdom that he gives you and shares with you, for he is always with you. I don't care what happens and I don't care how bad it gets as he shapes you, hews you, whittles on you. He's with you and he loves you. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. You want to make sure you don't get in that shape. He will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. If you say, I didn't know he was here, you're slipping, friend. Going to be a little whittling in your life. 17. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place! Really, probably the better translation would be, how awesome. 
This is none other than the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. Well, Christ is to you. He's your gate to heaven. He's the way and it swings both ways. 18, and Jacob rose up early in the morning and he took the stone that he had put for his pillows. All right, and what does he do with it? And set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And here you have the headship turned into that one that takes a stand and even to the very word ordain with the anointing of the oil of our people. And here we have none other than the stone of scone. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the time. Do you know what Luz means in the Hebrew tongue? Al almond tree. Almond or almond, I forget. Once it's the, shook out of the tree, it changes a little bit. But anyway, let me, let me give you the prime of the, this isn't even a Hebrew word, it's a Canaanite word. It means, it means early, all right? Uh, rapid, early. Why? Because it kind of come on early, all right? And um, Jacob vowed a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on. Think of this in spiritual food. He will give you truth and wisdom if you'll work at it just a little bit, okay? So that I come again to my Father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. For this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house and... Did it say the stone would be God's house? Kind of. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tent unto thee. So we see then that that stone would be carried wherever Israel went. And that stone would end up even under the coronation chair. That you know, many don't realize what the first obligation of the royal family in Great Britain is. Well, I thought it was to rule. Uh-uh. No, no, no. Not so. The number one priority is to be head of the church. Okay. Well, have they been good? Well, <laughs> I'm not going to go into that. It doesn't change the stone. People are weak and they kind of mess up, all right? And poor Charlie boy, you know, I, I don't know. I, you know, people are funny and we all fall a little short. But not the stone and not the promise. It's still that same stone. But it became a pillar. So what am I saying? From the very beginning, the opening and our way to God, to that that is above, was by this pillar and through wisdom in that great book of Proverbs. And I'm going to turn back to that ninth chapter of Proverbs real quickly, as, as, and I'm closing in case you're getting nervous and you're afraid the beans are about to burn or something. Don't worry, I'm going to get rid of you here in just a minute. And... Um, Going back to that book of Proverbs, because I think there's something you really need to know in all of this. It's real easy. Words are wonderful. But that pillar, that pillar that became that that would hold up and support the church, that's a beautiful thought. And when you do your little part from the many-membered body, that's exactly what makes it successful. Believe me, I know. Okay. But here is wisdom continued in that 10th chapter. And I feel it necessary that we go to uh, verse 4 of the 10th chapter. Because you can have all the good intentions in the world. But let's read this 10th chapter and see what wisdom says about one type of people. Um, okay. Um, well, let's take it with verse 3. The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish, and he casteth away the substance of the wicked. He'll, he'll rip it away from you. He won't let you have it. 
But you'll never starve for truth if you study utilizing wisdom. Here's what I want you to absorb. He becometh poor that dealeth with slack hand. Do you know what that means? Slack? It's lazy. But the hand of the diligent maketh rich. I don't know. Do you want to be rich? You, hey, you set your own lifespan. You've got what you uh, deal for. Uh, in another place, in, along about the 25th proverb or something like that, it says a lazy man is the, exactly as the hinge to a bed as the hinge is to a door. Okay, all it does is lay it on the bed and swings, you know, from one side to the other. So don't be a lazy Christian in this generation. Hmm? Be very, God won't bless it. That's what he's telling you, and that's what I wanted you to be sure and absorb. He won't bless somebody that is a lazy, wise person. And I'm not, I'm not necessarily talking about what you do with your hands so much as your mind. You know, your mind is a beautiful, wonderful, awesome thing. And if you don't exercise it, do you know what happens to it? It just kind of gets to look like gray matter. And what it means is it don't matter. Okay? So be sharp. Be alert. Exercise your mind. Pray for wisdom and for understanding in the very important simplicity in which God always teaches. Never let it puff you up that you could be a pillar in the church or even in God's temple. Because that would mean that you would be a worker reaching out to those children, whether it be through a ministry that reaches out, being a part, or whatever, or planting seeds. When you know when you, wisdom teaches you when that person needs to have a seed planted. And it could be what? Many things. Isn't it fantastic where America even is mentioned in the Bible? Huh? <laughs> But that, that's a heavy seed in a way, okay? The, the reason I say that, that's the one that got me, okay? Boy, did it suck me in, hook, line, and sinker, all right? Many, 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 many years ago. So, be a pillar, but be a worthy pillar. And do you know something about seven pillars? If you have an equal amount of weight and they are spaced properly, as they always are, in God's house, each one has the same weight to hold up. And anytime one of them slacks off, what does it do to the others? Hmm? Pretty soon, if several, too many of them take out, sorry, Charlie, there's a fall in store. Think about it in your life when it feels like your roof is about to fall in on you. Then get your back stiffened up and ask the Father for that wisdom. Father, thank you, Father, for your word, Father. Thank you for wisdom. Thank you for sending her to us, Father. May we continue growing in that wisdom more, 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 for we do starve for truth. As the people in the world starve for truth at this time, strengthen us, we ask it in Yahshua's precious name. Amen.